some of the congressmen that support Bolsonaro, they count with allies in the lower house. I think that we have a good tax. I think that we are able to see most of the lower house to approve that. Do you expect or do you understand that the president Bolsonaro could uh, be against this, this project? He has this democratic right of doing so. Of course, we have the legislative power and the judiciary power. They should, uh, the lower house should approve the text and then the president can, can exert his veto or not. His, it's his right to try and approve whatever he understands that that is relevant for him to, to approve or, or to whatever will be lower house from the Brazilian Congress. So how do you evaluate this situation? How do you see press under attack being accused of, of misinforming or publicizing fake news, but, all, but not only pre the press, the science has been attacked amidst the pandemic. So you yourself has mentioned that before. You've mentioned that before. So how did this situation? What else could be done to overcome this problem? Well, I think that in time, people will understand that they, they are being used. Sometimes there's this environment of people who, who are noticing what's going on. Sometimes they be reproducing or, or forwarding this information in social media, but the, their own experience will limit that experience. I think the time will help, but of course, uh, a lot to punish whatever we have as crimes in social media, of course, is going to, to enter. And of course, this will happen in this, this environment of fake news. Of course, we should have this legal framework, but raising the awareness of society using the communication means could have this important role to inform society. Because many times you, you may receive this text that was forward and then you can, can talk to that person and say, did you, did you see what you, you sent to me? And then to read and they, 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 came, they come to the conclusion that it was an absurd. So we have to raise awareness, especially of those who are on WhatsApp and end up being a tool of these narratives that are built. In fact, they are narratives. When you're watching, you have to be very uh, uh, brave to, to, to take action against that. Because people are talking about things that never existed sometimes. So it's a, something very, very serious. And it's for those who are studying this, uh, studying this movement. But so it's very important for people because people sometimes they simply read things and they have no idea of what's on. A question coming from now. Did the Congress have this information about the number of people who is misinformed by fake news? I have no idea. What about Felipe? Do you know about During the we didn't have we didn't have this number, but information. Another question from the audience. Something about the German example. Do you think that we could implement that in Brazil? So would you like to share with Rigoni or with Congressman Orlando Silva? Whatever they prefer. I'm not uh, talking about the TELF. They, they are organizing and they are bringing in their, their support. So they're going to have more room to talk 
about that later. I'd like to ask another question to you. In the process, some uh, media outlets said that you have uh, uh, received requests not to include the search to fight the company saying that uh, they are, we won't be able to contain the dissemination. So how do we evaluate that? Yes, I've received that. I've that the group that is evaluating. I don't have a opinion. We have to to find solutions. We don't have this closed solution. Maybe if we had a text that was ready, it would be easier. But now we are only receiving, we are assessing, we are forwarding that for the, the team that is uh, studying this topic, and they are going to have our support to, to talk up with, about that with the leaders. Do you agree about what is misinformation or not? Maybe you should have... Uh, an advisory board or a council, and maybe the platforms should uh, take off what is mis what is considered misinformation, right? Would that work? Or would it uh, be considered censorship or something arbitrary? Well, Facebook had an action two weeks ago, and they decided to 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 take off many different things. They may have responsibility and they may act against the structure that was assembled to, to pass information by hiding people, by hiding those who are behind the dissemination. So I think that Facebook was an example of, of, of the season. At least in the context, we should have this relevant fact that is important for this audience. Two more questions from the audience. Besides fake news, do you have another mechanism to trace the source of information that is uh, causing this public harm? For instance, concerning pandemic. I think we should use all of the tools. The most important of what is uh, is encrypted by going to the, the end of the chain, you go to the origin of the process. We, we won't be able to get the information of the whole, whole chain, but we are going to find all information and we will be able to get the going to have some of the person, but like that. I think that so that we are able to, to use the platform or the justice so that the platform can for me so that we can uh, start curbing that not in the origin but maybe at the end of the process would you include uh, message apps such as WhatsApp, because they are very relevant in Brazil. So you would include this this kind of app in, in the law, right? Well, I think so. I think it's very interesting because everything's ended to change or to get it. We are going to act at the end of the chain. If the data is maintained and filed, we can go somehow to the origin of the process. And from, from your evaluation, what is this of protecting data? And at the same time, fighting fake news. And the second question is, as this ethical council should be more active about the individuals that are spreading fake news, right? What is your evaluation? I think that the the agent, agent 
often important we're trying to build the instruments for that to to happen so that the agency won't to the government The President Michel was the one who, who was started, and the first decision was not the right decision. We have to change his first uh, idea. So we've been press, pressuring that we can find the right path. The, we see that other agencies somehow they have this relationship with the government and the state with the and the government and i think it's it's the other agencies I think it's an agency that, that should be distanced from any kind of government, not only this administration, but any other administration. Just a second, because I'm kind of lost right now. The importance of this data uh, and also fighting the fake news. I think that I've answered that somehow. I think we should be more independent. Uh, the more independent we are, the more representative to the state, it would be better for us to guarantee this the premises. Speaker Rodrigo Maia, thank you so much for participating. I thank you for being available to come to our webinar and have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you for your opportunity and uh, have you all a good day. I'd like to introduce to you our round table reminding you that we have this description on youtube it's a link that you may send questions from there and then we are going to open the round table and each one of the speakers will have 15 minutes to speak i'd like to thank felipe rigoni the congressman who is the co-author of the fake news bill of project and and the congressman orlando silva professor thomas petri who is an authority of data uh, protection from Baviera. Baviera. Each one of you will have 15 minutes to speak. And I'd like to start with this general question. Maybe we should say that there's this consensus. And the problem with this framework about fake news is not the need to attack this, its content, but maybe the funders. And also we should involve the digital platforms to fight fake news. So I'd like to know from you how to deal with this information without affecting the, the freedom of expression. I'd like to start with you, Rigani. Good, good morning. Good morning, Flavia. Good morning, everyone who is watching. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank you from uh, DAPI FGV. Uh, I thank the embassy and the, the professors. It's very important to have this, this discussion. Flavia, could you tell me when, when I only have five minutes to, to, to finish? It would be easier for me. That's okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try and uh, divide my speech in three parts, answering your question and talking about the context of this Bill of Project that I am the co-author. Co uh, we are now discussing this Bill of Law. When we started this process in April, in fact, the great intention was to to start this debate, start to start to, to debate this problem and find a, a, a solution quickly. Of course, we knew that the bill of law that we had started was far away from being perfect. It had many problems that we were able to find 
during the path. And as you've mentioned, it was talking about content. It would define this information. It would say how to treat about this content of this information, etc. When we advanced in this topic, we've, we've had many versions of this Bill of Law, three for the, in the lower house and some in the Senate, and we were able to notice some things. The first and maybe the most important that talking about content is not only hard, but you could curb the freedom of expression. Because of, because of the nature of this, of this, this topic, it's very hard for you to define because it varies, it changes, the forms how uh, information, the forms information take, they change. So it's very hard for you to, to insert in a law the definition of this information. So what did we learn during this period and that we are going to use? It's not talk, talking about content, but talking about behavior. In the sense, that's how we are going to fight this information, protecting the freedom of expression. One thing shouldn't overlap the other. One thing should not oppose to the other. They should walk hand in hand. That's why I believe that we have different axes in this, in this Bill of Law that should be included. Some aspects that are very important. The first one is the transparency axis. Transparency concerning what? Two things, moderating contents as it's made by the platform and transparency concerning the sponsorship of content within the platforms. So the transparency in these two things, in my opinion, is proportional to the fight against fake news as the transparency in, in public accounts is proportional to fighting corruption. So this is the, the, this, this very important step. You have to know better the phenomenon to be able to, to deal with this uh, effective solution. So the transparency uh, and also the, the funding and moderating of content can, can change this, this aspect of. So we, we know that the platforms are able to moderate content. So as you've asked before, will be they able to take off this, this, this fake news content? Of course they can, and they do that. The, the question is not if they do, it's how they do that, and if they are transparent about that. So we should mark the content as I violating the, the copyright, as violating the, the terms of use, as being information-wise. So they have to be transparent concerning that aspect so that we are able to understand the proportion of what's happening from where this content are coming from, how the moderation is happening. And from then on, with the help of institutions such as FGV, we should understand on how to deal with this phenomenon. And the transparency concerning funding, it's very important for people to know that the content that came to their stream didn't come only due to their preferences, organically speaking. Someone paid for that content to be there. So that is going to empower the, the citizen so that they are able to take their own decisions. So people will have the information about what's going on. And we are going to have the second axis and the project, and this is very important. That is the, the axis of, of identifying automated accounts. Of course, the robot won't be responsible for the information as a whole, but it works as it, as it, it's a gasoline because it's accelerating the process. They are creating artificial content and disseminate something if necessary. So many people would say, should we uh, 
finish the robots in the internet? Of course not, but it's very important to have automatic accounts, but identified as they are. The problem is not having robots. The problem is that sometimes the robot looks like a real person. It's behaving like a real person, but it's not a person. It's there to create artificial content. And this is the problem. The identification of the automatized accounts, I think it's important because so that we, we are able to remove this, this dissemination, so that we are able to empower people so that they know who are, they are talking to and not around it. And another question that is also important, in the text of the Senate, there, there are some, some issues that we have to talk about, but there, there's this part of this, this free. There are two parts and that only a few people can talk about, and I think this is very, very important. At the end of the day, the disinformation is coming so fast to the people, exactly because the data are very open, and that's why it's important to have the National Authority of Data Protection to be able to have a, a, a a, protect, a data protection in Brazil that is effective. And if you are on WhatsApp or Telegram, in Brazil, anyone is sending messages to every, anyone, even if they are in this production list. So there's a part that is saying that the, if the person wants, they enter. If, if they want to receive a message, they go. And this is, is going to, to empower people so that they are going to decide if they want to receive this information that comes in this collective. So that people can enter information properly. And this is going to have a great effect. And another stage that is very important, the fact that we are forbidding and we are empowering the platform. To send mass messages that are not authorized. For instance, WhatsApp has several partners to use. And they end up sending messages for millions of people. So that they can use a platform such as WhatsApp or Telegram. So I'm going to start with my final phase. Things that are going to, that are going to be discussed in a more profound way. This issue of traceability, as the, the speaker Rodrigo Maia said, there are two questions. We have this uh, fright of accumulating data, that was the great problem, and the other was the need of finding this chain.
content, this information is an, a strategy that is used by those who propagate the hate speech. That is why it's very important to listen to the Germans' experience to maintain the efforts that we have built in Brazil. Freedom of speech and privacy, they are part of the construction of Brazil, so it's impossible for a law to impact on the freedom of speech. One of the roles of the legislator is to preserve freedom of speech. So the new alternatives cannot contaminate the freedom of speech, like they cannot contaminate privacy. That's the debate that we had on Article 10. The law that fights fake news, the law of responsibility on the internet is part of the Brazilian legal system. In our legal system, for example, we have what we call assumption of innocence. Until proven otherwise, we are all innocent. So we need to pay attention to the collection of information in case it is necessary for a criminal or uh, criminal investigation to be used. An anticipated collection of data for a future uh, use that could um, harm the assumption of innocence not only for personal data, but metadata. Metadata can facilitate the access or identify people through this process of collection of data, previous collection of data. So metadata is supposed to be uh, approached very strictly. I believe that in a respect for privacy, we have to follow the recommendations of the general collection of data. It has to be minimum and to attempt to serve a specific purpose. It is not what that is about. It is about a reference so that we can guarantee privacy and avoid the vigilante state. If all of the information is available for the collection of the state, if it's for the, the treatment and use, where are we going to get to? Big Brother? There is already a collection, uh, collect, too much collection and too much treatment of data by the state. We have authorized the terms of use for the collection, even of voice. Those things, they have repercussions, and the market uses that, and the market does everything so there are no rules. Because we try to prevent the rules for the massive collection of data. So on privacy, that's what I would say, Flavia. It is necessary to have a minimal collection of data to um, serve purposes, predetermined services. Services. It is necessary to uh, avoid a vigilante state that looks at everything and sees everything, because this flirts with authoritarian desires. So we need to pay maximum maximum attention to this topic because it's very delicate. Likewise, we have the freedom of expression. It is a rule fixated on the Constitution. The freedom of expression itself can have limits because we have crimes. And racism in Brazil is a crime. Nobody can argument freedom of speech to propagate racism. So freedom of speech has a limit that is established in our legislation. What we can't do but the purpose of fighting disinformation is to crystallize the power of speech in the platforms. Article 12 from the Senate's text says that we have rules that establish some level of subjectivity for the moderation of platforms without notification. As Felipe said, they already do the moderation based on the terms of use. So we're going to institute on the law more power for this moderation. I think it is dangerous. This is, as far as I can see, it's a 
problem that not even the platforms claim. So it doesn't make sense for us to take part in the structuring of crystallizing the power of the, these platforms. Having said that, I would like to make a few comments. First of all, I agree with Felipe. Transparency is something paramount for us to face this information. This moderation that I refer to that the platforms do, what criteria do they have? This should be clear for the population. This is a very important point of the project. It can be perfected and improved, but this is a very important point of the project. The institution of rights and transparency of the platform. Second issue, I think it's necessary for us to have a logic of neutrality, technological neutrality of the law. It is very harassing for me when you see an article for WhatsApp and another article for Facebook and another article for Google without trying to make advertisements for the platforms. Because I am from the Orca generation. Orca for me was very important, but Orca does not have relevance anymore if it still exists. So it cannot do a law, make a law connected to one platform or to one article or to one technology. I say this because maybe the most important topic besides transparency would be establishing a normative standard, infralegal normative standard below the law, and turn it into an instrument that could be worked on by the council that created that law so that we could have the presence of the state, so that we can have the presence of the industry and the economic sector that we can have the presence of the civil society. Here in Brazil, the Committee of Internet Security is something very sectoral. Maybe we could think about an instrument, an legal instrument that has narrative competence to fix the norms in order to guarantee that norms are appropriate to the innovations and the technological changes. This is what I would call co-regulation. The Institute of Co-Regulation inspired by Europe. The Institute of Co-Regulation in Germany the Institute of Co-Regulation is something very important for us to give efficiency to the normative system that fights against this information. have infralegal norms so that we can advance in responses that are not necessarily established in the law that can't change throughout time. In the European experience, we have a code of conduct where the platforms establish their code of conduct and they are linked to it uh, voluntarily. Here we could have a code of conduct as well, fixated by the law that links the platforms. And the elaboration could be infralegal because it can change with more flexibility than the law itself. And maybe every year, I understand that uh, everybody wants to fight this information, and every year we can have ways to fight this information. So that, that can be the target. How, how much time do I have? Five minutes. I think we need to do the criminal typification of the conduct. It's not that anti on WhatsApp that we need to identify, that person that passes on the message without even reading it. We are talking about powerful structures that create messages that have a very big incidence in their distribution so that we can reach artificially a bigger audience. That's what it's about. Criminal institutions with a specific purpose to interfere in the public This is true for politics. This is true for other topics like the vaccination of coronavirus, for example.
This is also put into um, perspective because of the industrial scale of this kind of information. So that we can inhibit those scrums that are practiced by those structures. We have here a uh, deputy that it's against the typification of some messages. I believe that criminal right cannot solve the problems of Brazil, but in this matter, I believe that it's appropriate for this to be done. And I would like to conclude by making an observation on what I think it's structural to fight against this information. It's quality information. The ethical conduct of uh, our professionals in the offer of information to our population. Press should reflect upon the environment created in Brazil that to some extent created the space so that they can occupy with this disinformation and so that the press, the press's quality could be put into probation. I saw many times journalism producing the murder of reputations. This is a debate that we have to get through as well as well as public agents that try to disqualify the press. So we need to face this topic of publication and information. And also approach with education and media. I believe that education and media it's a, it's a path. I have a one-year-old son that gets his smartphone and tries to move it intuitively. Everything is different. If we don't prepare the new generations for this space, where we can have other lenses, other filters, it is not enough to have the national curriculum program. We have to have programs to guarantee the qualification of professors and teachers and qualify our and digital inclusion. If the population does not have access to the Checks, does not have access to the news websites, but then that's not enough because they receive those news on WhatsApp and Facebook. We have a huge amount of functional illiterate people in Brazil, and they don't have data packets to check if that information is safe or not. So, digital inclusion, media education, and strengthening this. Uh, Presence on media, I think this, these are important tools to face fake face news so that we can value conversation, we can value the freedom of expression, privacy, and also give instruments so that the state can repress criminal structures that are put together to disclose this information in Brazil. And we, have, and we need to remember that fake news also come up from political debates. Those who introduced the concept of fake news with Donald Trump to disqualify the press, to disqualify journalism, and to affirm the post-truth, to use the concept of the University of Oxford in 2016, to streamline post-truth. What matters is his truth and not the fact. This is also a topic that we should uh, we should reflect about because it has an ethical and political dimension, and there is a critical engagement of the whole society because this affects our lives and affects the accomplishments of civilization like the Mongols. Thank you very much, Deputy. I would like to call to the table Professor Thomas Petri, and I would like to start our conversation with. The Question. Professor, in your assessment, what contributions Germany and Europe could give to Brazil in the fight against this information? What we could do and what we shouldn't do in the sense. You have 15 minutes, please.
Professor, if you do not mind following just the mechanism, we're going to ask some questions to the audience. I'm sorry, once again, but for us, it's important to know what you are talking. So I'm going to ask a few questions to the deputies, and then we're going to return when the translation is okay, right? So I would like to ask the question to you, deputies, Rigoni and, and Orlando Silva. I think we could start with the question from the audience. How the text is being built and how it how we're building this legal framework. Professor uh, Justice Rodrigo Maia mentioned the YouTuber Felipe Neto as a possible person that could help in this process. But I would like to know if there's a joint work with the um, universities or researchers from Brazil, and if yes, which ones? I'm going to speak a little bit and I can be, people can add if they find necessary. Since the law arrived at the Senate, we had a lot of criticism. They were saying that the Senate was not listening to the society. And the Senate did the work of uh, listening to the society. We spoke to a lot of people, but we had this perception. So we had a public debate as we called it here in the Chamber of Representatives, and we talked about pretty much all the topics. The debaters of this uh, debate and the people who were interested in the topic, uh, we asked them to send us questions, comments, we received 20 formal contributions, very technical contributions for the construction of this text. So we had contributions from universities, contributions from many organizations of the civil society, like the Coalition of Rights in the Network. We had a lot of technical notes last week, and now, besides being open, it, open from any other contributions that may come from universities, we are also starting a stage of text discussion based on what was discussed and everything that was suggested to us so that we can see the improvements that we propose in the text. And this is going to start happening from this week on. But we had a lot of people who sent us very deep contributions. something and I would, I would like to ask you a second question. You mentioned on your speech educational measures that analysts consider important. So besides funding this information, besides tracking the funding of this information, do you have any action to educate the society on this information? Is it relevant for you? First of all, as Felipe said, there is no expert or scholar that studies this information in Brazil that was not invited to take part in a debate with us, either from law or from communications. Even people uh, that study ethics. In the field of politics, we had participation of many people. And the curious thing is that in every roundtable of the public debate, we wanted to have someone from the industry, someone from the civil society, and the academia. When we had different standpoints, we had more than one, even seven people on the roundtable. But that was part of the process. I say this, Flavia, because the argument that there was no debate on the Congress was dismissed after this long process of discussion that we had. There was a declaration from the president signaling at the end of July the presentation of the Bill of Law, and we are in September, and we are assessing it with tranquility. We are assessing the best way to present the text. And I would like to draw your attention to an aspect. Is there 
is there not an urgency? Sometimes experts say we need to have more time, we need to pay more. And I noticed that there are things uh, like Article 10 that talks about disability. It is a very passionate debate. I watched this controversy many times. I don't notice an evolution in those who make controversies on the matter. And I understand that because it is a new topic. If it was easy, the world would have already faced this matter. If it if the world haven't they haven't faced this matter, it's because it's a new topic. And because it's a new topic, there are no established truths. Our role is to try to find a synthesis, a minimum common denominator, and we have a different sense of urgency sometimes from the academia and this on this matter because the academia is going to fine tune the concept. It is right that the social practice has interfered in the political dynamics. Why the United Kingdom decided to leave the, why the, the United Kingdom decided to leave the European Union and Brexit the way it did. We cannot wait for the academia to fine tune it face such a practical problem that we have in front of us, which is the distorted uh, perception of the public opinion. People say that we have, that there's a lot of rush, and I don't believe that there's so much rush. I think in the Chamber of Representatives, we have had the most motion as we could. And the plenary is going to decide. As the president said, we probably will have a dialogue with the Senate so the chamber can ratify. We can agree with the Senate what is going to be voted on the chamber so that the Senate can maintain it. Education, what the problem we can do is put their instruments of education to stimulate programs for teachers. Knowledge that stimulates the critical capacity of the new generation. But this is a point of public policy from education. It has to be the final fork of the new process. On the networks, the municipal uh, state networks. It is very important that this team. I think everything is good with our translation now, so I would like to pass the floor to Professor Petri. You can move on, Professor Petri, please. Okay. No problem. So, we are the context of the European situation. We have separated and distinguished between protection of data and fight against fake news. First, we're going to look at data protection. In the European Union, we have a regulation for data protection. And this regulation is valid for the whole European Union immediately and for all of the member states. All of the member states must apply this law, this regulation. Right is applicable to everyone. Now we have some fundamental Deputies, the members that spoke before me, approached the size of principles. And one of the principles that it's important to mention, and that's fairly new, it is a fairly new element, is transparency in the 
treatment of data. Transparency to the European Union definition is that it should be understandable for the people in general. So who is responsible for the process of data and treatment of data? These people responsible should inform the person that is going to be affected so that the person uh, so the person is aware of what is happening in their region. That is a relatively old principle. This purpose was already mentioned by the representative. We should also look at the where we have a problem, problem regarding fake news. The law and protection passed in 2018 in the European legislation, saying that the person responsible should prove that they respected those principles when they processed the data. that the one responsible for the treatment did not process correctly the data that they are entering. So the burden of proof is reversed. Those who process the data are the ones in charge. And this is the role of data protection. I am responsible for data protection in Bavaria. And the president of the chamber, Rodrigo Maia, already talked about the need to have this um, agency autonomous and independent. We must have powers and competences of investigation, but also We must have competence to make decisions. Right, they can forbid, they can sanction some decisions, but also have the competence of taking care of those information. Since we have the data protection when we talk about the fight against fake news, we also have to be aware of that. That is a possible limit of the authorities of the state. I'm going to mention one example where the authorities of data protection could contribute in Germany. There are some extreme people that use the internet to call the citizens so that they could report professors and teachers that bad mouth parties said things that they find unfair about the the political parties so that they could talk about people who bad mouths Judaism from the opposites of this particle this party so the citizens can manifest and they can talk about information that they judge incorrect. The teachers are affected. Sometimes teachers can see on the internet attacks on them 
even though they're only fulfilling their roles. And the messages are submitted anonymously. And in this case, the possibility of data protection. They have to respect the principle of data protection. And in this case, there's a lack of transparency. It wasn't a fair procedure. There's a lack of transparency. Many authorities. This type of work in the platforms the authorities have um, informed the support of these ideas, these decisions of data protection. We have to assess the freedom of press, and this is also hard for people to make right decisions that are aligned with the fundamental principles. Approved net GG application. The providers and the platforms. messages to the wider audience. This platform, these platforms are regulated and controlled by this law. They need to create and introduce a complaint Area. The users that found that are considered injured, they can complain about it to the platforms and those providers. They can
Thank you very much, Professor. Now I'm going to open for questions. I would like to come back to the question that we already asked. I think Deputy Roberts already talked about on the educational part of it. Defense mechanisms. Should we think about an action to educate the population? So I asked this question to Professor Tiffany and Professor Petrie. I would like to ask if you think that this somehow is being applied to the European Union or to Germany. I think it's very important to have this media uh, education. I think it's going to be the, the main point where we could um, educate the citizens. We have an academia in which professors go through it's not only about approaching uh, political issues but it's important to have the mechanisms work there are free offers of trainings. This is either carried out because people are being nice or because there are concrete interests behind it. For example, my son took part in a training of this kind when he was on fifth grade. He Data protection. This is not only carried out by the students, it's also carried out by the teachers. To the teachers, there are also courses to by institutions where adults can our courses for several areas. Internet is an important topic in Germany. It's important to inform yourself on media, social communication. People have understood that that is important and that is part of our lives now. We need to deal with that. Um, uh, I would like to ask you resume, Orlando, see if we can also interfere, when it comes to education, we have a question from the audience, if it makes sense to focus this education and the training for the generations that were already, were already born digital, and the ones that have more expertise. This possible education should be more focused on the, there's some that the possible education can be more focused on the older people that can be more exposed to this information. What do you think about that? We can start by Deputy Rick and Deputy Orlando Silva if you also would like to add something. I'm sorry, Deputy. I did. Can you listen to me? Yes, I can. Just to go back to one point, the only thing that the students mentioned on education is that the fines applied because of the law, because of uh, non-compliance with the law by the platforms, will be dedicated to 
Okay. I think this has to be a little bit more specific so that those fines are dedicated to programs of media education performed by the Ministry of Education and Culture. Because you can have more specifically, uh, this fund being allocated more specifically. I think something else that we could discuss, I'm not sure what is the specific way to put that into the law, is how we can stimulate the platform to have more programs of media education and stimulate, for example, institutes of media education that we have in Brazil. I think this is still a debate that we need to have and maybe put as general guidelines of the law. I think this is going to be very important. I think this education should be for everybody because a new generation is more digital, maybe more digital, but there's so many channels to achieve information that arrive to us in different ways. I think that we need to have a beautiful program to teach people how you can verify information. How can you get to the original source? What can we do to find out if that fact? that I learned on social media or the conversation that I just had, how do we know if it's true or not? How do I compare the information? This is true for earlier generations, the generations that were just born, and the ones that are older because they're not uh, used to this uh, digital world. But I think at the end of the day, as Orlando said in his speech, we have to have qualified information that is going to mitigate information in the country. We have many ways to do that. And one of those ways is to teach people how you can verify information that arrived to you on a link via WhatsApp or Telegram or Facebook. We could do that not only in schools, and I think that it's important to be done in schools, but also in campaigns of media education so that we can see how we can deal, how we can teach people to deal with this new world. Uh, Deputy Orlando Silva, would you like to add something? Yes. We cannot forget the fact that we have 40 million children and youth in schools. We have to prepare the teachers to prepare the new generations. Of course, the media of communication can vary. We always talk about the fight against information. Maybe they can research other sources to affirm that that information is true and not be deluded by misinformation. I think this is true for everybody. The older ones in Brazil used to say, pay attention, don't believe everything you see on the internet. That's what the older people said. And with time, the older people are the ones that reproduce the most the news that are broadcast on the internet. It is a complex problem because the skepticism of the time became a blind belief now. Maybe we can multiply the mechanisms, but it has to be said, it has to be said as a permanent component of education. Those who are in school, um, the state has to have the obligation of stimulating the development of the skills for people who um, aren't. I would like to thank you for your participation, everyone. And I would like to suggest here a extreme synthesis power in one minute. If you can wrap up, we're going to pass the floor to Professor Rudiger. I would like to ask a question before that. It is a very objective question. I would like to ask the two deputies that are here. In our standpoint as researchers of DAP and FGV, we have a lot of interest in the control of those information. So we notice many times that the 
public power is being used in communication and the website may generate this information. Would you think it would be appropriate for the legislation to include a provision to use as a norm the use of blockchain in the public money so that we can know exactly where this money is being invested in the communication area? So that this money can be used in platforms or websites that generate this information. The, for the two, the two representatives, Professor, I think it's extremely important what you just mentioned. Again, we cannot be trapped in mechanisms that uh, need to define this information. We need to go along the lines of certain behaviors that were already identified, like the fact to the honor and these kinds of things. But there are many suggestions on the table for us to um, condemn in some law if the public money was used in websites or platforms that disseminate or have committed some crime against the honor. But this idea of blockchain, I thought it was a great idea. I haven't actually heard of that before. We can talk about that so that uh, we can find a way to put that into the law. I agree with the professor. A brief idea would be to maybe forward in Britain. Someone from your assistance can forward to that in Britain. Maybe uh, we can discuss a chapter that was not very much discussed. It is not very much discussed because it, it is kind of controversial. Um, it is a chapter that assigns public interest to the public accounts, and I think we need to advance this debate on the public um, power requiring the transparency of the public money on, the, on those websites. That's very important as well. Uh, as well as I defend those information websites, cannot use appropriately the public money. This topic is on the table, and I think it would be very valuable to have this contribution. Yes, we can forward this idea. We already have a very advanced document on that. We can forward this uh, to you. I think it's important because Actually, the discussion is pretty much focused because we have freedom of expression, but we also have a discussion on the limits of tolerance to what is intolerable. So the intolerable speech and hate speech cannot be accepted. We have to draw a line in the society so that this, this is advanced or else you are attacking the democracy itself and the rights of people expressing themselves. So I think the tolerance to the intolerable is something that we can find inside democracy. That's the first point. The second point is we need to have a clear definition of what is tolerable and what is not. In our society, for example, we have racial uh, crimes and we have racial hatred as a crime. So we cannot have information that attacks people's identities and people's views of the world. This is something very important. And the most important thing is not to sustain that indirectly. Sometimes it's not clear to anybody. Maybe if we could structure that inside a blockchain that could give us clarity on where the money is going, that we can find transparency to the public money, we could do an extremely relevant service to the democracy in Brazil within the condition in which the social media is such a central element to the political life. That is my consideration. And I would like to, I'm not sure if our time is up, if someone would like to say something else, I think Flavia and I was going to conduct this um, final words. That, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Professor. Actually, our time is up.
So I would like to come back to those final words, those summarized final words that I asked a while ago. Maybe for minutes to each one of you. We can start with Professor Thomas Petrie. Moving to the end of our round table. Please, Professor, take it away. First of all, in my perspective, a key topic is that the entities of protection must highlight the transparency so that people could understand what is happening with their data and also what is the kind of data offer. Transparency of data, establishing the transparency of data is the most ambitious goal. It's how we can train people to classify this information correctly. It's not that we are not, and we're not going to take the role of a teacher and tell them what opinion they should have, but it's important for them to be able to distinguish true information and what is being used. That is also decisive. Transparency is important and also able to classify the information and the news. Those two would be the goals, the most important goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Professor uh, Deputy Rigoni, please. I would like to thank everyone, Professor Petri, Flavia, Armando. I think this discussion is extremely relevant. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I would like to say that on the next few weeks, we are going to decide what kind of text we want to take to leaders in the plenary. So your contributions are extremely important. And I would like to say that the transparency in the content is the most important total alignment to the data protection law with those mechanisms of media education that could give us an introduction and a good solution that we are finding to be able to track that those or, uh, criminal organizations that are funded by millionaires and that are there to create consensus and to alter the of the society, I think we can bring a law that's not, not only going to be effective and protective regarding freedom of expression, but it could also be a reference to the world when it comes to fighting this information. So thank you very much, and I'm at your disposal for any other questions. Deputy Orlando Silva, I would like to thank you for your moderation. Professor Marco for the coordination of these initiatives, um, Professor Thomas for his presence. I would like to agree with Rodrigo Maia for his initial statement. And I would like to say that the Tudor Vargas Foundation follows this mission of illuminating Brazil, debating important topics, and I'm very happy to be a partner of the Getulio Vargas Foundation and uh, to take part of the Getulio Vargas Foundation. Myself and many other colleagues, we are aware. Our constitution establishes the freedom of expression as artistic, scientific communication, freedom of expression without any kind of censorship or license. And this is going to be sustained in the standard that is going to be voted. We have the goal to protect each person's privacy, and this is going to be sustained in the text that is going to be voted. When we approved the uh, civil framework of the internet years ago, we're going to be as bold now to defend a text that strengthens democracy, flexibilizes the access to democracy and to technologies, and can produce a regulation in our legislation so that we can have a good solution for uh, the social life and politics on the internet. Thank you very much, and I'm sure that Brazil is going to 
give good contributions to the world in this debate. I would like to thank everyone for your participation, and I would like to wrap up our event here, and have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Good afternoon.